Hi all, let's have a look at another very interesting Magnus Carlsen game against the top women's player in the world, Yifan Hu. So this was in the Tatar still tournament earlier this year. C4 for Magnus Carlsen. E6, Knight C3, D5, D4. So Queen's Gambit declined territory. And Magnus chooses C takes D5 here. Now the flexible Knight takes D5 is played, not yet occupying d5 with a pawn and here there are two main moves it seems either e4 for example like this has been seen a lot before so that's one of the main moves or the move knight f3 which basically after c5 just is a transposition so quite often uh, but here actually curiously Magnus Carlsen chooses the move e3 this does hem in the queen's side bishop. So what's the idea here? e3. It's much rarer than the other two alternatives. After c5, just bishop d3 is played. c takes now. e takes. Knight takes c3. b takes. And queen c7 hits the c3 pawn. Magnus protects that. Knight d7. Now. Another quite interesting and curious move, instead of the routine knight f3, Magnus chooses queen g4, which keeps an eye on g7, so the bishop can't move just yet. And after knight f6, queen g3 just offering the exchange of queens. Black takes that hg, which opens up the rook. So there's a bit of rook activity. Bishop d6, knight f3, b6. With the idea of bishop b7 and maybe exchanging off the light square bishop would seem to be a, a reasonably good plan for equality at least. a4 to try and dissolve the isolated pawn here. Bishop b7, a5, so both sides pursuing positional plans. King e7, keeping the king in the centre. And white keeps the king in the centre. Knight e4, and white preserves actually the dark square bishop just in case it was going to be taken h6 c4 the knight goes back bishop c3 now and now bishop e4 trying to get rid of white's bishop pair so will magnus end up with any advantage whatsoever here rook hp1 putting pressure a bit on the queen side black takes off the light square bishop and knight d7 is played Knight d2, and now there is a certain concern on the dark squares here with the knight potentially coming to e4. This dark square diagonal is of interest to white. And we see now here after rook hd8, knight e4, this starts to look a little bit scary. Already uh, the move knight f6 is difficult because knight takes d6, and either black is losing the b6 pawn, that's going to be horrible after rook a6 or the pin uh, will be horrible rook takes d6 bishop b4 so already it's a bit scary and the bishop actually retreats this seems to be asking for a bit of trouble here this check yes it's not something you'd go out of your way to invite <laughs> especially if you're playing the world champion but after king e8 it seems actually here with the king on d3 that the very tempting knight d6 check isn't a killer check for example, well, in the game, f4 was actually played, keeping a clamp on the position a bit. If white went with the check, it seems bishop takes d6, and the move here, knight c5 check, would be okay for black, because here we've got a nasty pin, and black should be equal from this position, about even. So Magnus avoids this tempting possibility, by playing f4, rook ac8, a takes, dissolving that isolated pawn, activating the a rook, and the rook infiltrates, knight b8, and here a very interesting decision indeed is played. I wonder if you can guess what Magnus plays in this position. I'll give you five seconds to pause the video.
Okay. An exchange sack. It's not entirely clear. This is an amazing exchange sack, by the way. Uh, one thing to look out for when doing a position exchange track exchange sack is how many pawns you're going to get immediately, and the and the trend. Is it going to be a positive trend? Off the check. King uh, sidesteps away from this diagonal, losing the f7 pawn. So if King f8 here. This check would win back the exchange, and yeah, with interest actually, this continuation, and white could end up a pawn up and a pass pawn there as an example. So we see king d7, which doesn't offer in any way uh, the exchange back, but loses this first pawn. Is this enough for white? It's not just winning a pawn here; it's isolating this e6 pawn though. Rook DC8, check. And white looks pretty secure, even though the exchange down. This looks like quite the bind, this position. After C5, Knight C6. So a second pawn is one. So two pawns for the exchange now. Bishop C7. Okay. And there's some maneuvering now. White trying to infiltrate potentially. But rook a2, g4, king e7, g3, check. That's taken. So we're getting to a raw uh, simplification here, knight against rook, but there's, there's two pawns for it at the moment. Check, king c5. Now, technically, it seems after f5 that this position should still be with best play. Perhaps it should be equal with best play. Rook g2 was played here. Perhaps safer might be rook b2 to attempt that pawn forward. Uh, and I'll give you an example long variation here where it seems black should be okay technically. Okay, so um, in the game, though, we have rook g2, knight e4, rook b2, g4, rook drops back, knight d2, rook h1, d5. Now here, I think this is a serious mistake, relatively speaking. It seems that black should try and it's it's getting hard for black to play this position, even though black's the exchange up. But maybe black should try rook d1, it seems. This doesn't it just seems pretty unpleasant with all these passed pawns here, these two passed pawns, but actually uh it seems that the rook just keeps harassing from behind here. And even if we get this kind of scary looking position, it's about even. But what happened in the game here? This is at move 50. Is that black chose the move h5? And this seems to change the picture now. Magnus plays d6, just offering this g pawn as a sack because these pawns are really dangerous now. With the b1 square covered, uh, yeah, there's a way of queening the pawn now. If black took, then b7. And how is the pawn. Um, stopped it, it gets really dangerous after rook h8 knight c4 and the check here and then queening so yeah this is really dangerous to take on g4 we see instead king c8 but now g takes h5 rook takes and it seems now we're reaching a critical tilting point where the pass pawns are decisive yeah, it seems the rook might be in the wrong place, even though it's scooping up a pawn here. So it's only one pawn, but it's more significant now. The king is a menace here. The knight is a menace. These two pawns are nearly there. And the game actually ended here. I'll give you an example continuation. Black resigned, feeling it was hopeless. If rook f7, b7, and for example, king a7, d7, and this is just going to be winning. 96 the pawns are going to be queening one of the pawns are going to be queening and that's it 
yeah it's uh a fascinating uh game from tatar still it seems uh, the longer the time that the more magnus colson's games are a grind which is why i like to look at actually some of the blitz and rapid review them from from earlier this year as well but this this was an example uh positional grind where black had a really it seems a difficult position to play even though the exchange up uh, so sometimes I guess one of the, the lessons for, for those wanting to do or experiment with positional exchange sacrifices is that sometimes even just one pawn is enough if you consider fracturing of the opponent's pawn structure you might be isolating a pawn as well so sometimes it's said that two pawns is in general more than enough but here it was like one pawn plus some other little positional benefits and it seemed to be very difficult for black to play Okay, I hope you got something out of it. Comments, questions, likes, shares, appreciated. Thanks very much.